The Zone Coverage Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is the Minnesota Soccer Podcast, and for the first time in two months, I am in the studio, and it's great. It's good to be back. Tom, Nick, I see you guys. It's amazing. It was a surprise. I was surprised. I was delightfully surprised. Well, I wasn't at the game with you. It's not hard to surprise, Tom. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. I'm easily shocked. Were you at the game? No. Oh. You watched the game. I did. I watched it on my iPad. Was your dad at the game? Uh, I believe you, so. How would you guys not go to this game? I don't know. He may have been. So, so I what you're know. saying? I don't know what my parents do. <laughs> so what you're saying, Tom, is you were not one of the fifty-two thousand two hundred and forty-two announced attendants. It's an today. impressive number. Impressive so number. They, they well, it's, I guess we can start there because that was kind of this big promotion that they've been working towards for about six weeks now. Is the fifty k to Midway breaking the? What's the technical like, title? It's the professional soccer club attendance record for Minnesota so for for the state of Minnesota, which they successfully did easily. I know we we had an opportunity to talk to United CEO Chris Wright at halftime of this game, and as a result, we missed one of the goals. But we'll get into that later. <laughs> Some um, of us may have kind of missed both of the first goals. The yeah, half. but you know details. But so <laughs> Wright said that. Like, it's one of those things where it's like, anytime you see these attendance totals, you're going to see gaps in the seats because people didn't show up. But based on the tickets sold, they were going to easily get the record. And lo and behold, the announced attendance sure enough did that. But it was a pretty full house at TZ, do, I think. Do we know that the Minis- it was the Minnesota Kicks, right? It was the Kicks, yep. Something 78? Am I close there? I don't know. I in the old, so. in the, yeah, old yeah. the old Metropolitan what, Stadium. What number did you say? Uh, it was 48,000. What number am I trying to... St- 1978, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you were trying... I was, The year you are going Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it was no, something... Yeah. Like, do we know that... the right ballpark. Yeah, do we know Sounds that... about right. Uh, do we know that 70 or... What was it? 48,000 people actually showed up to that game, right? It's just kind of a... That was tickets sold as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, and and so here's here's a stat that's interesting for you. That's our first cross sport reference of the night. I love it. Um, this one's from just saw this on Twitter about half an hour ago from Ashley Norling, who's a contributor at E Pluribus Lunum, writes about a lot of more lower level soccer teams in the state of Minnesota. Uh, tonight, Minnesota United drew fifty two thousand two hundred forty two at TCF Bank Stadium. Uh, on the flip side, their regular tenants, uh, the Gopher football team, has not drawn that or more since the Wisconsin game in 2015. I think that's an interesting stat, given that they could technically play. I know that the TCF was built before <laughs> uh, U.S. Bank Stadium, but they could technically play there as they played in the Metrodome before. And uh, and the fact that it was supposed to be on campus and that was supposed to draw all these people in and you had at least Kill and um, P.J. Fleck, who were the big recruiters. Who should who should kind of draw up for themselves, but yeah, I think a, I think a portion of that is due to the ineptitude of the teams for sure, sense, for sure, you know. But but yeah, I, by the someone, same token, not like United's actually good <laughs> for sure, and hence, but why they were why the only reason they were able to you know reach go for le- go for football levels of attendance was because of this massive promotion so it's not like it's not like this organically happened and it's like oh minnesota united's outperforming go for football that's not we all know no, sure. took place i would also say you know, just touching on because as someone who covered go for football uh for the student newspaper of the university of minnesota at the jerry kill era you know being in the stadium today was was it was a cool feeling because I- i've been in that stadium when go for football has sold out or had tons of play tons of people in there and it was that type of atmosphere uh and so it was it was really cool to see just in general that they they could bring because because the you know the attendance was right around fifty two thousand. tcf's capacity is fifty five thousand. Mm-hmm. um so yeah no it was it was really cool to see that many people showing up for a soccer game well and it like you said the atmosphere also fit right which it's a question when you push this far above your normal attendance is like, are you going to just get people who are showing up because they got handed free tickets? Are you going to get people who are actually going to be into the game? And by and large, it seemed like people were into the game, were paying attention, were cheering, were doing the thing. It's particularly noticeable. United does the thing where whenever they have a corner kick, the flat, the scarves go up and spin. 
everybody was paying attention and doing it. Like it, it's one of those things where it's like you you had an engaged crowd of this many people in the house, which is that's cool to see because it's you. I don't think you get that Twins games half the time. To well, be and I, I think I think that again speaks to soccer and what makes like you. What makes see it special? We yeah. see soccer catch fire all these different places: Portland, Seattle, other countries here. Like one of the main reasons, one of the secret sauce components is that is the is the atmosphere is like that because the game is is so engaging because it's nonstop. Once it starts, there's no breaks, there's no commercials. That it's going when you're in the stadium, and there's just an energy within mm. that, and that's what pe- keeps people engaged, as you point out, which only enhances the atmosphere more and more. And Chris Wright actually had a really interesting quote about this when he spoke to media at halftime. He, uh, to paraphrase, because I don't, I haven't transcribed his stuff yet, but what he said was he he previously worked. Um, as the um, CEO, I believe, of the Timberwolves. I know he works up in the Timberwolves front yeah, office for a long time. Somewhere, yeah. Um, and, and he said, like, the difference between, like, a Wolves game and a United game is that he, again, to paraphrase, he could, like, he knew exactly what was going to happen down to the minute of every single Timberwolves game that he ever, like, worked for and dealt with just because it was so scripted and scheduled and, like, team produced like you have the promotions you have the cheers you have the t-shirt handouts you have all this stuff that's like every every minute that's just how it is where in in the same role at united it's it's fan driven it's driven by the people that it's for and the club's job in his eyes is to enhance what's already happening rather than to implement their own things which i thought was a really interesting way of looking at things so that was it was it was an enlightening quote. I'd like to take take a little bit more of a look at what he said I, in that. I, later. I thought it was interesting. You mentioned how soccer is kind of always flowing, right? That you don't have as many breaks as other sports. I did notice on the ESPN broadcast, they're introducing something where um, I think of like football today. They always have the game break, right? And you go and you focus on one game. So for Vikings fan, it tends to be an NFC North game. Uh, they did a similar thing. Like it actually threw me off where I was like, wait, why are they showing this other game? Like did I, did something with my internet screw up? And I think it's just during interview or injuries and other, someone must be calculating this out being like, you can actually break up the game a little bit, which is funny. It's a perfect with both worlds where for the fans, you never notice it. And I wonder, for the yeah, TV, you that, see and that, that, I think that's stuff. a fine concept too. If done right. Yeah. If you do it a few times and you don't take away from the the game that you are in fact watching, I think an element of that maybe why you saw that today too is, as a lot of people in the press box were touching on, uh, was the 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 end of the seasons here. So the postseason uh, yeah games matter here. And, and what's going to no, take yeah. place is very much on the line in all these different games. So. Yeah, people checking scores across the league as 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 results come in. So well, I think that was what was going on there. And, and in addition, it's going to be something that we look at next week too, because um, I I was watching the ESPN feed of the uh, Atlanta yeah Atlanta yeah. game that was on ESPN before Minnesota's game was today because I got to the stadium really early to just keep an eye on stuff. And yeah, they were breaking in to show goals, but part of that's because I think. Every MLS team except for one, I think, played today at either 3 o'clock for the East teams oh. or 5 o'clock for the West teams. Yes, yeah, so that was Atlanta-Chicago. Atlanta-Chicago, yep. yep. So they but so they had the Atlanta-Chicago game on, but every time there was a goal in another game, they would do, the, do yes, what you said. Yes, that's what I was – yes, yep. Uh, and, yeah, and, yeah, I do think part of that's because we're in – this is the second to last game week of the year. And the next week, it, if I remember correctly um, – MLS plays every single kick next week at the same time. Oh, it's what baseball kind of does, and it's like what that, they do yeah. in the uh, what yeah. they do in the Premier League, what they do in other leagues, basically to ensure that other results aren't dictating like how a team plays. Or like in in Europe, it's been instituted to not mess with match fixing as a yeah. primary thing. Cause it's harder to fix fix a result based on another result, or to have two teams well, play two t- like say there's a situation where two teams both need a draw to get into the playoffs. And they can just lock another team out, and they know that ahead of time. Yeah, you're gonna get a crap game of soccer, which you see that every now and then the World Cup. I yeah, and I I like that idea. I think also for the league, it's smart. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, with the local broadcast, they probably should implement something like this because you don't want fans of United to check out as soon as the season ends. You ho- hopefully they latch on to Atlanta or something like that, just so that it's kind of like baseball, like tons of people. St. Louis and Minnesota are out. We probably both watching, mm-hmm. you know, the it, it, kind of this run of the World Series, and I think that's a smart thing for the league to, to look into. Yep. So it's 
it's it's going to be interesting, and we we're, we'll hit on this after we talk about the game a lot. Minnesota's going to continue to have an impact in the playoff race going into next week, not for themselves, but Columbus needs a result in their game next week. So that's going to be an interesting game to see how it goes. But let's let's talk about today's game. Um, Nick and I were both there. It was – we had the opportunity, which I know Nick and I talked last week about whether or not this was likely or not, to see Zlatan Ibrahimovic, one of the world's great players of the last 15, 20 years, play 90 minutes in Minnesota today, which is really cool. He went out, got a goal and an assist – the club did what they could to mess with his persona. And he he was quoted, I think, on Thursday of this week as saying, oh, they're having 50,000 people come to the game because I'm coming. <laughs> like and and if like if you're not if you're not familiar with Zlatan, that's just what he is and how he conducts himself, how he yeah. conducts himself. And the the outsized personality is just. It, it, it's not even an act. It's just who he is. <laughs> Zlatan is Zlatan, and this is what he does. So to to respond during uh, they introduced the away starting lineup on the video board, we're putting pictures up of everybody else. For when they introduced Zlatan, they put up an image not found link. <laughs> 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 to just, nope. It, it, who who's this guy? He doesn't matter that much. Yeah. So is they, they, they did the little things every now and then to mess with them. I think what, we should- what's funny to think about that is like, if you did that to someone on the team who has like not had a prestigious career, like that'd be like really mean. Oh yeah, for sure. Like for imagine sure. if they accidentally like this dude's first ever career start MLS and they like actually don't have his picture. Like that would be really cold. I but, think we should do this to Nick. Nick is the biggest ego. He's kind of the Zlatan. I don't know about talent you wise, but to, you don't need to not show people my pictures. They're out there. They can find <laughs> me easily. <laughs> I'm not worried about that. That's yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to leave that. We're going to move on. So the game game starts. United's playing. They actually had a really, really good opportunity to score 30 seconds into the game, which was interesting because one of the things they talked about after the game, Miguel Abara specifically thought they might have been a little bit nervous today, which, I mean, this is the biggest uh, crowd that this specific team has ever played in front of. Um, yeah. at home, but yeah. they shouldn't. It, it, I Miguel brought it up. I didn't bring it up. I, okay, I'm still going to refute it. That's fine. To you, because he's not here. That's, so, that's acceptable. No, I I I completely dispel that notion, and I, I'm i just going to go on a little bit of a rant here, because like I, I feel like I think there's been a lot of different like facades going on a little bit lately, and that's one of them. If they were, if as that being any sense of a narrative, also the fact that these games like that United players cared about them, I don't think that that's necessarily true. And uh, I talked to there's a couple people that you know I know behind the scenes that I can't like reveal who they are, but I was talking to one of them this week, and and he was pretty much confirmed that not a lot of these guys care about the you know at, at the, these remaining games a lot of these guys are under uh longer term deals as i as i pontificated last week on the podcast but a lot of these guys are on longer term deals and they'll be back so for heath and for others to imply that like them to care about these remaining games that don't affect any postseason is a little silly um and frankly i feel like that's the way that some of these games have played out i mean i think Darwin's a decent example of today because I I felt like he had a poor performance, um, and and just really didn't 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 take the game by the scruff of the neck like he he can do and is kind of expected to do. Um, so there's that, and then as it goes to the size of the crowd, Miguel played in League MX, which is a vivacious atmosphere. Darwin Quintero's played in League MX, incredible atmosphere at every game. Uh, Francisco Cavill's played at the World Cup. Brent Coleman has played at Atlanta United Stadium. He's played a, ga- a game with a crowd of 70,000. So, and so have a lot of other guys on this team. So, for me, it's for them to say that this atmosphere played any role other than to spur them on and be motivational is poppycock. Good word. In my estimation. All right. That's fine. So, you, so, and it's not like, the mistakes that we saw on the defensive end in particular were anything new 
to this club's performance this year with particular one of, one of the early themes of this season was the club's lack of proper marking on set pieces which has has improved throughout the season but the galaxy's first goal from Zlatan Ibrahimovic was a prime example of how in the world is the opposing team's best player a very large Swedish man who is very good at heading the soccer ball left wide open <laughs> in the penalty box w- on an opportunity. Michael to cross Boxall, it in. what happened there, bro? Well, it's like, just Boxall's of- got to have him. Like, like you point out, if you're gonna mark anyone, literally it's him. anybody on the field, it's him. So I don't know how that happens. I think, yeah, I mean, he see especially too because he's like I, re- I remember it vividly like uh, Calvo's one v one with that guy and he's clearly like looking to take Calvo on and likely cross does exactly that so there's not really a a great excuse for Boxall not to be marked up there yeah and it's like there wasn't anybody else in the box it was just like yeah what are you trying to do there because the the cross went straight over his head you watch any Galaxy games too you know that they'll kind of force feed slot and crosses you know that uh so yeah I don't know that there's it's one thing too of like Zlatan like if it would have been like a good ball and Boxall's there, and Zlatan that then beats him to the header, like just because he's like does some awesome movement or outpowers him. But he was just not in his position or not marking him tight, and and that's where it's definitely you you know Boxall loses points there. Well, and it's one of those things that it's like it's it's a it's a single mistake, but it's a mistake that gives up a goal, right? Like these mistakes happen. Like we saw later in the game. Us and other people were very critical of Fernando Bob's performance in the first half of this game because of the number of turnovers, bad passes, things that led to Galaxy possession, led to Galaxy scoring opportunities. There, there are mistakes. It's just like a, a, a mistake like that from Boxel comes at a way higher cost than turning the ball over in midfield most of the time. Uh, yeah, and you could say that, right? You say that about goalies in sports and, and defenders like, their mistakes are magnified because they're the last line of defense or what have you. And so that, that's definitely true. Again, though, like it's it, like it being Ibrahimovic makes it less, almost less of an excuse for yeah. Boxall because it's like, dude, you know, we all know. So it's, it's hard to just excuse it as a brain fade, which is what it looked like. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so United went to the half down one, nothing. They'd had scoring opportunities. They probably had. Adrian, he said after the game, and I agree with him, they'd had the best of the scoring opportunities in the first half of this game. Between Quintero's chance in the first minute of the game, um, Rodriguez's goal that was offside, a couple other crosses from Miguel Abar that went straight through the box and almost made contact. Like, they looked threatening on offense. It's just there was the disconnect in midfield that's signaled so many of the problems this team has had this year where possession turns over and where the Galaxy aren't forced to work on defense for extended periods of time. United started the game well, but as the game like progressed and the Galaxy got into the game, there were no there wasn't consistency from United in possession, which has been one of my biggest criticisms of them this year is they can't hold the ball. They can't create continued pressure on a team. They did a better job of that in the second half after the Galaxy were sitting back with a two-goal lead, but it's it's one of those things that like that's where the game slipped out of their control. I th- I think that's I think that's a poignant point, especially because one of the things that LA did especially well today is they looked so comfortable in possession. You could it's one of those things where you you you, you hear criticisms of other soccer managers when you can't tell what their style of play is because that's a bad sign usually. Why can't we tell what you're trying to do? If we can't even tell what you're trying to do. What are the chances you're going to be successful at doing any strategy? And L.A. today clearly represented a team that wants to possess heavily, play out of the back, do their, – their philosophy is is clear and they executed it to great effect today. And and I think that is a concern because it's, it's not always clear what United is trying to do. And again, tactically, you know, from a Heath's perspective – he did. It, it did become clear that his strategy today, for whatever reason, was to go was to go long. Mm-hmm. They sent everything up to Angelo and Darwin consistently. So that's clearly like they shifted and went with that went that direction tactically. But but man, LA again to your point, 
looked really good in possession and clearly have been working towards that. And it was interesting because the the long balls today weren't were different from what we've seen earlier this season in some ways because it's been a tactic that they've tried since Angelo came into the team more, I feel, is to hit it long to Angelo, let him get control of the ball and try to set people up playing with his back to goal, which he's done, I feel, a decent job at in a lot of ways and not always in easy situations. Like he had one of the chances that he had to go through on goal today was a ridiculous bit of possession where he's managed to split two defenders after getting one of those long balls down onto his chest and got, got through on goal and didn't get a shot off, but had a really good effort at that. And Adrian Heath was very complimentary of Angelo's efforts the past few weeks. Haven't come with goals, but it, it's, it's continues to be like, what do you, what do you want from a striker? And a lot of people are going to say goals, and that is a very fair criticism of what Angelo's happened. He got one goal today, had a couple more very, very good chances, and but also did good stuff with without taking the chance at goal, in my opinion. I don't know where you're at on his performance today, but... Yeah, so, yeah, so you're saying uh, regardless of any goal scoring, you felt he played well today. Yes. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I think it would be really hard to make an anti Angelo argument based on today's performance. I thought I thought he definitely performed as one of the better loons on the day, certainly. And, and also, I mean, yeah, Heath's confidence in, in in Angelo shows heavily if they're if based on the long ball strategy today to trust his hold up play, which for the entire time he's been with the team has been very good, yes. very good. I I think I think it'll be. It's funny, and I don't say this to like, you know, disperse, you know, from talking about it now, but like Heath and Lagos, Angelo's grade, his real grade will really come about 10 games, 15 games in the next season because that team will be robust roster wise as, as one of the things CEO Chris Wright said, which we've all would would obviously imagine would be the case this offseason. But but again, coming from the business office is important to hear Chris Wright saying that Minnesota United is going to be aggressive this next transfer window. And he said things um, to the like that this roster will be very different next season. He even pointed out that he expects the team to be far more competitive next season. Again, him acknowledging the lack of competitiveness the last two years and then saying that they're going to do something to change it. I think so that's obviously important. So anyway, my point being that this team is going to be ideally much more robust roster-wise. They'll have all offseason to work on their tactics and philosophy. Angelo, in in like manner, then will will likely be set up for a lot of chances. So his finishing will be on clear display, 10 games. And, and we've seen some of it so far, but 10, 15 games in the next season, uh, we'll have a clear, clear understanding of what Angelo brings to the table finishing-wise. Yeah, for sure. I think... I think that's going to be one of the things to keep an eye on. And then the other, another player that, that has like that kind of idea is with is Romario Ibarra, who returned from his hamstring injury today. And he talked specifically after the game about, we're going to see the best of what Romario brings next season. Like we're going to see what we see in this game and probably next game. Cause I, I, I asked him if they were what we would see from both he and Abu Dunladi, who returned from his hamstring injury today, if we'd see any more from them next week, what we could see. And his answer was, we're going to see what we see, but the I think we're really going to see what we get from them in 2019. It, the implication implying, like specifically to Mar- Romario, like his, we'll see what like the most from him next year because he'll have been with the team all that time is that the implication and healthy and like i yeah like i assume that's what the implication is yeah because no i i think romario is definitely one of the building blocks right now uh, of this team going forward um (laughs) yeah and again as we picture the starting lineup or the the players used heavily next season I got to be honest, and it's it's something a conversation topic that we've we've hit on both on and off the air multiple times between the two of us. But honestly, I, I've I'm I'm as out on Miguel Abar as I've been. And today he had a couple of nice moments, but for me the stain the same sticking points are still there. Um, he can't dribble one on one, 
and take anyone on. He can't get around people. And as an outside mid, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't do enough otherwise. Uh, he, To me, it's like those situations, um, if anyone ever watches like – the NBA and you like see like LeBron try to make a good play and like one of his supporting cast messes it up, mm -hmm. whether it be he in Cleveland or now in LA. <laughs> and he does that. Even the moments where you just, you know it, you're just like, oh yeah, like Brandon Ingram messed that up or J.R. Smith or messed that up. McGee or Michael Beasley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and there's sometimes, right, LeBron does the like, oh dude, and he does the shoulder shrug like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. messed that up. <laughs> to I J.R. Smith. I was going to say, in, insert the JR, picture of yeah. LeBron like yelling yes, at J.R. Yes, Smith. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I I feel like I've seen microcosms, mini versions of that numerous times this season when it comes to Darwin and trying to link up yes. with Miguel. And, and, and I just he, – he's a very good professional soccer player. Of that, there is no doubt. He has very good positive attributes, crossing, first touch, passing, uh, hustle – but but for me he is he is not he is not a a starty a starter quality MLS player for a postseason a, a, a postseason team. So I I think I think he has to he has to go to the bench. He is and that's and he actually could be a very nice bench player. That could be a great role for him. But guys like that they they're not cutting it. And they need to they need to be removed from the starting eleven. Yeah, that's and that's the question. You bring up the point of whether or not he's a starting player is is a team by team discussion. But whether or not he's a starting player on a playoff on an MLS playoff team, I think that's a very valid question. And like we we've t we talked last week about that there were trade rumors that are going were going to surround him this offseason whether he was going to receive a new contract from the team or be re-signed or be traded it's i think it's a very interesting question that is not an easy one obviously like i have really enjoyed what miguel's done this year i think he's done a lot of good stuff it seems like he started to fade at the end of his season from the best parts of what he did in june and july and august whether that's lack of motivation, whether that's lack of energy because he's played a ton of minutes in a ton of different positions and he runs like basically nobody else on the team. These are the questions that you have. He he was one of the – I talked to he and Brent Coleman after the game tonight and they both – we talked about like the next time you play a game in Minnesota, it's going to be on audience field. First thing both of them said was playing on grass, which <laughs> True. Is, is a talking point that we've talked about before, but it's like – it just it's gonna feel better. They're gonna be in better shape and not ha maybe be in better shape and not have to be in the training room. Be able for guys like him that run so much be able to sustain that more. And again, it's one of those things you can look at that as an excuse, but it's a long running topic and one that a lot of people have talked about before. That that's gonna improve things for every player on this team is playing on that grass field every week instead of playing on turf. Uh, for sure, for sure. Uh, the the tough part. And, and this is something fans should be aware of because it, it does potentially re affect Minnesota United recruitment is because of the climate, they still would have to do a decent amount of practicing at times on turf. On, yeah. And like, let's say someone like Wayne Rooney or Zlatan Ibrahimovic were semi-interested or interested in coming to Minnesota United, that would be a strong sticking point. Mm -hmm. That would be a deal breaker well it's the in some ways well and it's the same thing we see in every professional sport that minnesota's had the tundra tax like that's something that we've talked about a lot with the timberwolves is yeah. you've got to overpay to get guys here or you've got to it's got to be like exactly the right fit and yeah. it's going to be the same thing with mls recruitment to and, minnesota but, and i like that's a great term i've never heard that term tundra tax is a great that's a great term for it turf tax is, is the same thing is the yeah. same it's like it's like it's like add-on tax mm -hmm like an additional tack and it's a very real one for soccer players now from a positive note them playing the rest of their games forever on grass that is massive mm -hmm. and that is huge and if you can go to you can go to potentially a wayne rooney or a slot and be like okay like you really don't have to practice those three weeks then that we that we do preseason on turf and then everything you do is on grass 
that's that's huge. It was interesting. Zlatan actually talked about this a little bit tonight because he said it was the first time he'd played on a turf field in three years. Because see, I mean, that's what I stay away from it and exactly. It's like, and it's it, it was just the little things that he talked about. It's like yeah, it's the first time this year I've cramped at all. Like wow, and like he, there were there are the reasons behind it. It's like this is why I haven't done this in three years and he's like we've seen this a lot with teams traveling to minnesota this year it's like you have carlos vela for lafc stays home oh, there's lots on the first time the galaxy comes stays home because they don't want to play on turf and they don't want to risk their bodies like that and they're of the status where they can just be the coach I'm like i'm not doing this and for better or for worse that's not going to be a thing next year is you're going to get people's best shot which is good yeah but it's it's one of those things that it's going to be a thing that we can consider and think about more as the as the off season comes because it's it's the future. The next time United play a home game, it will be at Allianz Field on a grass field, which is very very exciting. So, what else did you have from this game? Do you have any any particular thoughts that crossed your mind? I mean, just a couple, obviously. But the as we're talking about the stadium again, there it was cool because again, uh, as we mentioned. CEO of Minnesota United, Chris Wright, talked to the media at halftime. And one of the things that he seemed to really want to highlight, which was cool, is basically just reminding that the way that the stadium is built will, like, keep sound in it. Uh, and we, we, we started talking about this podcast about how how awesome the atmosphere of a soccer game can be. If they're doing – right, you're adding little things like that, that's only going to amplify. And that's really cool, too. So I, I liked that. I, I didn't know. I, I don't think I knew that prior to today. I, I did. It's one of the things they've talked about on stadium tours that we've done in the past. And Yeah, you've been to most of the stadium tours. Yeah, with how, with how the stadium and the, the roof part of the stadium is constructed, it's going to be like a, almost it's, – it's, it's open, but it's like an open box, right, where everything's just going to be like – sound pointed down at the field it's gonna be loud in that stadium That's and with awesome. with how like fifty thousand fans twenty thousand fans you and i have been to almost every home game this season the wonder wall does work for 90 minutes every single game of this team and it's one of the things that the players keith everybody that talked whether it was after the game on the microphone to the fans whether it was during media after the game it's these guys know that the fan support they have is incredible. The supporters group they have is incredible. And I have a feeling next season they're going to come even if they can pump it up even even more, they're going to. So that's like it's it's going to be an amazing experience to be in the stadium for that, even just as members of the media as we are. Um, yeah, anything if you're good on that, any other thoughts about the game today? Uh, I felt I felt from a Minnesota United perspective that Darwin had a poor performance, as I referenced earlier. I Um, agree. It was like, and it was like a two way thing. I think one, he just, he was not, he was not his, he was not his vivacious self. Like he, so at least five times a game dribbles by a couple guys and has a mazy run. And I don't, I can't even really remember him doing that today. Maybe he did. I'm not saying he didn't, you know what I mean? But it wasn't much. There were, there were, encounters that he had with a defender with the ball that you would have expected him to win that he did not win which was and out of the ordinary and not just ghost not just like creating out of nothing Mm -hmm. like really powerful chances for his team and that's he just he didn't look as dynamic as he usually does and i don't know necessarily what to attribute that to i think part of it is it it didn't seem to me that he had the ball as much as he normally did, whether that was the Galaxy denying him a ball through positioning, whether that was where he was on the field or whatever have you, it seemed like, like this isn't, this is the thing I wish I had stats for. It seemed like he had less personal possession of the ball than he does in games normally. And and I think that Galaxy playing a possession style attributes to that, but he, he still... As is when they always go forward, he's he's a focal point. That yeah. People are looking to find him, and there just wasn't a ton of good quality from him today. Yep, I I very much agree. I like I said, I I think some of that might have had to do with the service, but at the same time, we've we know what he looks like when he's at his best, and he wasn't that today. Like we've seen everything that he's done, and he's still like even through this, he gets the perfect cross in for Angelo's goal. Well, like, of course, he's he's yeah, got yeah. the moments at at all times, but it wasn't. 
70, 80, 90 minutes of Darwin at his absolute best, which yeah. that's been a theme of these last three games, all losses, is eh. Darwin hasn't been great. Agreed. And and that uh, still, it wasn't that he did, he was a complete no-show, certainly. But that's another element, though, that I, I would say about it, is it felt like it was a, it was a game that... And you could say any Minnesota United game can feel this way in different parts, but it was like a more of a whole game that felt like he needs help. He needs mm-hmm. people around him. And I, I think everyone knows that, uh, that that's, that's, that's a top priority, and it's going to be really interesting to see how the front office deals with that. I thought there were a couple of – there are some moments that will stick with me from this game. Um, the first – I, there were, I think, two or three times where Zlatan went into a challenge with a defender, Brent Coleman or Michael Boxall, and went to ground and did not receive a call from the referee, which was greeted by loud cheers from the stadium. As as you and I noted, Zlatan enjoys his time on the ground from time <laughs> to time and did not really receive any star calls today he at didn't, all. Which is a credit to the referees because, like, he had been doing this in copious amounts in other games, going to ground way too easily. So the credit to them for noticing that, well, it's seeing spe- that. I remember that clearly from the game in L.A. against the Galaxy, that he was living on the ground. Like, it was bad. And it was referee- when the referee He's speed six, to it, it's good. Six. <laughs> and he like was on the ground like constantly. Any touch he got, it was... I'm yeah. Credit to the referees for curbing that. I, I would also because that could be a dangerous trend. If every uh, star player thinks they can come to the MLS and just do that, that's gonna that's gonna distill your product. Well, and we've talked about that with Darwin before this year, right? Like Heath's talked about. Maybe if Darwin goes to ground a little more easily, he's gonna start getting calls. But right now, he's not getting calls when he is getting fouled. And it it's it was good to see. It really did feel like I thought the referees handled this game very, very well. There were hard challenges and there were calls that probably could have been made and would have been made in other games. But there was a reason that there was only two minutes of stoppage time on the second half of this game. There there weren't that many stoppages in the game, in the flow of the game. It was really solid there. I think only three yellow cards over the entire course of the game, all in the second half. Like, And... All were justified. One of them was to Galaxy player Roman Alessandrini because he would not stop whining to the referee about not getting calls, which, yeah, he deserved that. But um, It was too bad. I was actually hoping for, like, another, like, 15 minutes of VAR reviewing. I really wasn't at all. <laughs> I, I, wanted, was, I, wanted, I wanted at least 10 minutes of VAR reviewing and then, like, a small scuffle to whet my appetite from last week. It, <laughs> well, it's... It, we can... <laughs> I'll touch on that in a bit because I want <laughs> I, I want to come back to that, but there were there were a couple other moments from this game that I liked. Um, Michael Boxall clearing a shot off the line with a bicycle kick was an outstanding moment that I just barely watched, and it will get lost in the film because it was thirty seconds before the Galaxy scored the second I, goal. I did notice that, and I was like, "Cool, that should happen more often." <laughs> it was it was ridiculous. Like <laughs> Matt Lamp Matt Lampson got beat on like a loose ball that floated into the box. This is right when we were walking back down to the seat, so I just barely saw this on replay, and and Coleman like just the ball is bouncing slowly into the goal. Boxel gets in there, clears it off the line, and it's like, that was awesome. That was the loudest the stadium was all day, and then they give the second goal 30 seconds later, and it doesn't matter. So the second half was <laughs> a mess because they they had Chris Wright available for interview. Yeah. So at halftime, yeah. so all the media get out of the chairs. We go up back to the back of the press box, yeah. and we're interviewing the CEO important stuff which is great right. they're, they're they are you know like allowing you to talk to oh, yeah. upper management. Yeah, and it's not stuff. and it's not the first time that's happened this yeah. season by yeah. the way oh, it's yeah. been a pretty regular they've had, thing they've had mls commissioner don garber do yeah. that yeah. no it's great stuff from minnesota united and minnesota united pr but let me tell you a story so then that goes a little long just a little bit into the second half no big deal you yeah. would think well and we notice like I hear the loon call the second half started. You hear sound from the crowd. Like, clearly stuff's happening, and I'm keeping half an eye on the monitor yeah. to make sure I don't miss anything important, right? Right. Um, as soon as he's done talking, essentially, L.A. scores a goal. As soon as we're done, like, so no media is witnessing this. Yeah. And L.A. scores uh, the second goal. 
I am right next to a monitor in the back of the press box, so I just I'm like, oh, okay. I heard the crowd. I'm just gonna watch it happen, yep, and then yeah. I'm go to my seat and watch the game. Yeah. So I watch it happen. I'm like, all right, that's how that happened. Da da da. Note to self. Da da da. I'm gonna go. Oh, I need to go to the bathroom. Okay. It's gonna take a yeah. while to start the play. I go take what could not be longer than a 20 second bathroom break. Naylor, do you have uh, do you have stats on this? I, I didn't time him, but he was <laughs> he was not gone for very long. 20 seconds. I come back outside. I've gone into the bathroom. It's two zero L.A. 20 seconds. I come back out. It's three yeah. zero L.A. And I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. I've been out of my seat for like four minutes. What's going on? And then it gets back in United score within a, mi- like and a minute I, and a half. Yeah, and then I sit <laughs> back down and United scores within 10 seconds. Yeah. It was like, if I'd, have, if I'd have had to take, as I will say for the listeners, a number two yeah, in yeah, the bathroom, thank you, thank I would have missed three goals. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Unbelievable. I, on TV, it was jarring because I was not watching with volume. And you kind of had to do a double take. Be like, "Oh, is that a replay or whatever?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I digress. But. Yeah, no, it was it was uh, well. And that was the moment before the the box of clearance off the line was right before the second goal. So like we were all still standing up on the on the terrace for that. I only saw the I heard the fans, and then I'm like, "Was there a goal? Like what happened?" I didn't see the field, so we're we're stuck watching the TV replays. So I I did not get to see that live, well, and I would have liked to because it was one of the louder moments of the day. It's also a bummer because if that goal makes a one two. With all the fans, you think maybe you shift the momentum. It's weird. The way you describe it, it seems like this team is now just the road version in the last it's five years. It's starting to feel like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it seems like that's what they did on the road is that they just blew up all their Well, it's, they, got, they got housed by Philly and eliminated yeah, from the playoff. Right. They And eliminated from the playoff race, even though they were way, the, way far out from it. And then since then, they've just kind of been this like drab version of themselves yeah. which is what we've seen on the road this year yeah. and the other the other moment i wanted to touch on from the game is united had i think two uh, two for sure maybe three goals counted off for offsides in this game which one of them was an amazing goal by francisco calvo oh God. which i am very upset didn't count because it was one of the, it would have been one of the goals of the year for this team yeah that dude should only play defense he should definitely only play defense. Scores like what would have been top three goals of the season. I mean, Darwin scored a lot of nice ones, but this was just classy all around from Calvo. Well, and it was I a- can't believe he's played center back for a season and a half. That is unbelievable, unacceptable. Not not cool, dude. And it, it, cool. it was it was an example of we talked about the long ball gameplay. It was an example of the long ball gameplay, but a wrinkle in it because it was Calvo making the run around the outside. Fernando Bob took too long on the ball, which is what got Calvo offside. Calvo's run was perfect. It's just the timing on the ball from midfield has to be better so that Calvo's not offside. Yeah, I mean it's harsh. Bob serves in a. It was. It was a. Ball. It was a perfect ball. It was just a step yeah. late, which is why it wasn't the goal. Yeah. And the same thing for Angelo had a second goal in the second half that was very well taken from the right side of the box, but it was almost exactly the same position that he was caught offside and checked by VAR in the Colorado game, which. You coach soccer as your full-time job. This is now several times in the last month that United lost goals to offsides. How do, like, is there a coaching fix to this? Is it individual players? Like, what, how do you fix that problem? Yeah, I mean, it's, it has, at this level, the the great strikers have a sense of that. And they have to because it's such a part of their play is mm-hmm. so much more part of their play than it is for anyone else in the other positions. So it you have to take it as a knock on, on Angelo of not having the right sense. You could argue, though, that it is a chemistry thing because at the highest level, it's which timing, right? It's like, very much a timing thing. And so Angelo might be breaking at what he thinks is the right time or in position what he thinks is the right time. But he's got to be able to get that feed too quickly. So at, at these levels, the seconds matter. And so he needs to try to be – he needs to toe that line. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and it's tough. It's tough. So I, I think you could argue it as a dude who joins this team halfway through the season. You would think, though, you would think that Darwin, as a fellow Colombians, that they might have a better connection. Um, but it's something that, 
again, could be very much down to them not all playing together for a long spell. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, like, that's a thing that you you knock out in preseason next year, right? Like, you spend some time getting those timings right, getting it's, feeling it out. It's one of those things that's, like, really subtle. Yeah. Like, um, when you play with someone for a while, you start to know, like, oh, like, He's looking to his right, but in this situation, I know he actually wants to cross break. it to me. Yeah, and and it's it's it can be really tricky. It can take a while for different guys, but it's something that like it's in all sports probably. But again, in soccer, as I've played at different high levels, like it's something that when you play with someone enough, you're like you start to know their trends and know that like oh he's looking for this or this is his style or he'll dribble in this situation or he likes this and that's really helpful that is invaluable which, so like, so you, let's give them some of that too which you can see that you you can see players tendencies the more you watch them too like the i guess the most the example that comes to my mind first Darian Robin right Arian Robin will always cut inside from the right side to the left so he can shoot off of his left that's a tendency that everyone who's ever watched Arian Robin play knows and all of his teammates know and everyone that defends him knows not every tendency like that is as obvious but every player has stuff like that like there's there are guys who i want to shoot off my right every time always and forever weakness or strength is a conversation but it's like how you how you set that up and what like the runs you make and the positions you take to allow yourself to do that are tendencies that get picked up as you play with somebody and as you watch somebody right like that's it just seems like one of those things that like yeah the more chemistry they can build the better it's gonna get yeah absolutely no for sure for sure especially because in a lot of times in sports pass with passing you have to disguise that it's it's these guys are the defenders are too good that you have to and so not only are you having to like disguise what you're doing to a defender that's gonna throw off a new teammate mm-hmm. it's like he was looking that way and then he passed it that way he was disguising the pass because there's defenders but as as a teammate that's not clear that's not easy to see yeah for sure um next week looking ahead they go to columbus um for the final game of the season i forget what mls's hashtag of choice is for this i think it's like deadline day decision day whatever one of those things um they play columbus who um based on the results earlier today columbus actually had a loss to orlando city which is a really bad loss for a team that's chasing a playoff spot um would have clinched a playoff spot with a win today and would have been all but clinched with a draw the loss means means that they need a win against Minnesota United next week to clinch a playoff spot. Um, a draw is not a safe result for them. Um, so you're going to see a Columbus team that's going to come out and try real hard to beat Minnesota by several goals. It's really hard not to imagine them winning, especially because if I was Heath, as I said to you earlier at, when we were at the game, I'm playing tons of reserve guys as much as possible. I'm playing Wyatt. I'm playing Pangop. I'm playing uh, Manly. I'm playing Toy. Right, all those guys should see minutes. I don't know how you could argue that they shouldn't see minutes in this game. And you agree? Like you look at the you look to the bench for this game. Like Omsberg's on the bench for this game. Dunlady's on the bench for this game. You got a lot of your like young potential players that we've been talking all year. They need to get minutes in. And now this is a game like you don't have to go impress your home crowd. And Heath Heath talked about this like. He had a quote that is in my recap, which you can find on zonecoverage.com, um, about like what they were looking at next. Because that was kind of that was what I asked everybody I talked to in the United locker room about is what like what is what are you what are your goals for next week? What do you what do you want to achieve? And Heath, interestingly, focused not not even on his own team, but on um on Montreal, who are the team that can catch Columbus with a win. He's it. We quote from Heath. We owe it to Montreal and everybody else. That's what I've just said to the boys. This might be the last <laughs> game here, but the guys in Montreal have worked as hard as anybody <laughs> to get themselves in position to have a chance. And we owe it to them to go and put a performance in you. <laughs> yeah. Yep. He went there instead of talking about his own team. We owe it to Montreal. Yep. What? That is a direct quote. from What Adrian does Heath. that even mean? We owe it to them. Have you ever heard of that in another sport? Have you ever heard, like, the T-Wolves be like, we owe it to the Atlanta Hawks, man. <laughs> really, I, like, I, baseball occasionally. 
Yeah, well, I, I know. You've I heard a coach. Say yes, that. I've seen. I remember Garden Hire talking about this in the bad. We owe it to the Chicago White Sox. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, se- in all seriousness, like, like, yeah, it, we, like in these last playoff games, yeah. it's Honor. like we're not. I, I, I get the, I get the, like a coach should always take the tact of our team should end with pride and and all this. I, I think, um, I don't know why, babe. Maybe because it's every day. Like you, you rarely hear it in football. I think it's just an, an understanding that they every game they're wow. going hard. Yeah. Call I'm not. I'm monkey. not. I'm not suggesting it's not ridiculous. I'm just saying it's not. <laughs> I was gonna say, call me a monkey's uncle because I've I've never. Heard I, that. I I've heard it too. I'm not recalling a specific instance in this point, but it's like, what else are you gonna do at the end of the season, right? Just go out there and lose I, five nothing and not try. You could say you you could. There's different things you could say, do, but do it for Montreal. That's. That's the you owe, it, you owe it to Montreal. Can you, you imagine? It's, it's, um, what does that mean? It's like any given a team Sunday. that we compete against and want the worst for most of the time. We owe it to them in this to situation. actually try. You, you, you don't remember the uh, Al Pacino uh, speech in, in any given Sunday where we owe it to uh, <laughs> another team. <laughs> I don't know. I'm does trying to think of an epic speech. Does right? he say that in that movie? He does not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Every, uh, you have to. I hope he like does and somebody calls you out on it. No, what's that? You guys fun. don't remember that speech? You have to give an inch or whatever. I don't know. It's an epic. I've never seen movie it. Speech. Okay, Miracle maybe would be another one. You got to do this. One. <laughs> do this for Finland. <laughs> do it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't don't do it for the the name on the back of the jersey. Do it on the front. Don't do it for the name on the front actually. Do it for the name on the front of Russia's jersey. Uh, the, yeah, the they front of the other jersey. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's interesting, but yeah, so so the, I do not anticipate a win for Minnesota United next week. I anticipate no. that they might lose and they might lose by a lot How of goals. How sick would it be though if they did win and they do what I say they should do and play all the reserves and like Toy has two goals and like Wyatt looks awesome and like Hang Up looks great. Like and they win like three to two. Like that would be awesome. That would look that'd be cool. Yeah. So like it's not gonna happen. It, it, I would not bet any amount of money on that happening. It, so yeah, because I I'd imagine they're gonna be if you were a betting person, there'd be some extremely long odds on Minnesota United getting a win next week. <laughs> extremely sure. long odds. Like sure. I mean, they're they did, on the road. They did have the ridiculous game in Atlanta last year, though, right? Like it's weird stuff happens every now and then where they For went sure. where they went to Atlanta, like the best team in the East, and beat them in their house. Like who would? Well, maybe it's because again, if you play the reserves and they they actually do have a lot to play for, I would I would that has a much better chance. Like, or who would you give a better chance of beating Columbus? Reserve Minnesota United or starters, quote unquote, Minnesota United? Who has who would you rather? You, you you do think the reserves might run a little harder though, right? Because they're fighting for their places on either this team or another team. Yeah, like, and they're all young with something to prove. Mm-hmm. I I think that's a fair play, and it's it's what I'd like to see because like, we want to see game time for these guys for all all these rookies that you mentioned for see if Don Lottie can get ninety minutes, and it's like I he talked about the fact that like with Don Lottie and Ibarra, you want to make sure they're healthy. You do, but, you do, but like, I also you also want to see them get ninety minutes, right? Like, and like if they get injured, what games would they miss? And, and I'm not at all like suggesting like, hey, play them anyway. But if they are like good to go, like, and they did get injured, like if they pass their medical tests, and then they like, what are they gonna miss? The off season just begun, like after that game. So I don't know that that's a good excuse but yep that's that's pretty much it one week left until the end of the mls season Min- minnesota finishes it off the mls playoff field is almost set i think there's one seed left in both sides of the playoffs to be determined which the galaxy i believe are now in control of their own destiny because real salt lake is finished and they lost today so if the galaxy win i think they are in next week um, wow! Yeah, they definitely are. And definitely Columbus, are. if they if Columbus wins, they are in. If they lose randomly, and Montre- to Mason Toy to Mason Toy, and Montreal wins, Montreal jumps them for the sixth seed. But other than that, the playoff field is set. Do it for Montreal, man. Do it for <laughs> <laughs> you. You, you owe it. Nick Hallett, you personally owe it to Montreal to go out there and give ninety <laughs> minutes of your best football. Oh man, that's I'm I'm glad. I don't that know you just anything to any Canadian that. city. They've done nothing for me. Shout out to Ottawa, I guess. <laughs> Winnipeg. Winnipeg. It's our sister city, I think. 
the, it's it's the <laughs> is it really i mean well it's the closest like canadian city to, that's true uh, to should we play a game yeah. where we all have to keep naming canadian cities and see who runs out first i uh, boy that's not moose jaw vancouver <laughs> toronto <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, once uh, once we run out of NHL, saskatchewan or is that a province that's, that's a province that's a province that's just fun to say. <laughs> yeah nova scotia i think it's a province too that's also a province i what are we what are we doing yeah, let's here? move on let's move on i was fake suggesting we do that okay yeah you that's what you get for fake suggesting something to tom schreier <laughs> i will do it i tom will, tom will do it that's the problem so your your 12 teams if we if we assume columbus wins and we assume la wins uh 12 teams in the mls playoffs are atlanta new york red bulls new york city philadelphia dc united and columbus in the east and Sporting Kansas City, LAFC, FC Dallas, Seattle, Portland, and LA Galaxy. Nick Hallett, who wins the MLS Cup? Looking at it right now. Atlanta. I mean, how could you? Why would you not pick anyone but Atlanta? Uh, DC United That's a wins good MLS Cup. They'll be in it, but they'll lose to Atlanta. DC, they'll make it. I, I think DC has a very good chance to make the East Finals because just because they're playing better than everybody else in the league right now, except for possibly Atlanta. Like, they're playing awesome soccer wait is atlanta in the atlanta's in the west atlanta's in the what are they in the east yeah. what, what side, side of the, of the co- country <laughs> is atlanta on nick <laughs> okay i just like i pair them so much with minnesota united that i just think yeah okay east final is dc united dc atlanta, atlanta. Yeah, and i think i fun. i think dc upsets that uh, they could yeah they i could. think they very much could it, it's hard though because the road uh, atlanta atlanta wins the supporter shield with a win or a dr- with a win next week, Atlanta wins the supporters' shield, and the other, therefore the playoff road goes through Atlanta the whole way. Yeah, which that's just that's such a hard and, place and to again, go to play. Yeah, those are two reasons that I I I don't think DC United or anyone was going to stop them. Is one they'll likely have home field advantage, and as we know, that's right now the best ticket in MLS home field wise. Uh, also, they they had such a great season last year, and were unfortunate to lose on penalties to the Columbus Crew last year in like a really like character defining way that I think that that's going to catapult them further. I can see that for sure. So, yep. So we are one week away from that. That's going to be interesting to keep an eye on as Minnesota moves into their off season. And we've also got all of the European action moving forward. We've got the U S men's national team developing. We've got the U S women's national team looking ahead to the world cup. We've got the champions league. We've got Got gold cup, this gold cup this summer. Like there's a lot coming up after the season and we will be there to take you through all of it. Any final thoughts, Tom? What is going on at ZoneCoverage.com these days? Oh, we got we got a lot of a lot of wolves. Given the Jimmy Butler still on the team, <laughs> look. Although he did not travel to Dallas, some Vikings stuff. Vikings obviously beating the Jets as expected, but kind of on a roll. You can't again say here. as expected after the Buffalo game. Yeah, there's no yeah. more as expected. Yeah, it was one New York team at least uh, upset. I'm not didn't, not the second one. Didn't you guys do a Wolves podcast today? Yes, we just Sell did. Us on that. Uh, yeah, we we talked about uh, reactions from the first three games all a little different kind of a moral victory i know i know they don't like saying that but but against the spurs uh pick up the win at what? home that's the moral victory the spurs game was a moral victory well i mean more it, so than the dallas game yeah the, and then the dallas game without butler where I, I i'd argue against cleveland they didn't play much defense either but they really didn't play defense against the uh luka Doncic and the uh Man. dallas mavericks so yeah i looked over that and uh Kind of looking forward to that stuff. We will have some Iowa Wolf stuff. So looking That's at kind the of the minor leagues. Um, Bikes played today. Yeah, yeah. As I was saying, yeah, some some reactions from that. Um, wild early season stuff. Wild wild stuff. Uh, you might Gell fans uh, degenerate gambling <laughs> uh, tips and that that podcast, which is absolutely hilarious. A lot of a lot of fun. Stuff Are there any there. good players on the Wild besides Devin Dubnik? Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. I, I think actually Suter and Prezi are doing fine. It's more that it's the same. Dubnik's been incredible. Back. Yeah, like, Dubnik's kind of held him in there the whole time. Yeah, dude. I mean, ugh. actually, yeah, no, I won't get started. <laughs> no, I mean, so yeah, so you, so Heather kind of does more traditional reporting. You have Giles doing film, Ben doing opinion. You're gonna get three different perspectives on the wild. On, nice on the site. Yeah. Yep. And go for football suffers another really embarrassing loss at. First, uh, it was in Nebraska, at least. It was in Nebraska, but, um, yeah. But, yeah, first win for – and uh, Martin was not there but wrote about it. Um, the first win for uh, the 1-7 Huskers, the one I think. And seven. Yeah. Huskers who have been awful. Yeah, yeah. Um, Winless in Big Ten play, I know. Well, and also coming off a game against Ohio State, which Ohio State crushed by Purdue this week. Or, yeah, this uh, on Saturday. And uh, 
Minnesota hung tough with them and didn't really build the momentum to uh, you know go into Lincoln on that. But so, a lot of stuff going on. It's a busy season in Minnesota sports. We've got all of that covered for you on zonecoverage.com. I know um, looking at the end of the season for the Loons, we'll have some postseason coverage for you of MLS Cup, and we'll have some looks ahead to next year, reviews of this year, all that kind of stuff for you as we get into our off season. Um, and with that said, we got one more game. We got one more week, and we got one more regular podcast for you guys that will come next week at the usual time. So with that said, we'll be done for the week. So for Tom Schreier on Twitter at tschreier3, Nick Hallett on Twitter at Prince Hallett, and myself, David Naylor, on Twitter at Prof Cedar. This has been the Minnesota Soccer Podcast, and we'll see you next week. Do it for Montreal.